This is a special episode of the East Stem Cell Podcast, ISSCR 2023, Day 4. Hey everybody, we are Drs. Daylon James and Arun Sharma. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. Today, we're back with our final episode from the ISSCR 2023 annual meeting in Boston. We'll be discussing highlights from day four of the meeting and sharing our thoughts on how it all went. If you're tuning in for the first time, be sure to visit www.stemcellpodcast.com or your favorite podcast app to check out our episodes covering the three previous days of the meeting. We're going to kick things off in just a minute, but before we get to that, Managing human pluripotent stem cell line variability and health during maintenance can be tricky. Explore a variety of resources from stem cell technologies at www.stemcell.com slash cell quality to find out how you can assess and maintain high quality HPSC culture. Yeah, let's dive right into it. This is day four, the last day of ICCR 2023. I don't know if you can hear it, but they're taking down the plenary hall and they're taking down the conference hall right above us. There's some banging and roaring up there as they take down various pieces of equipment. We're going to go ahead and recap the the day for you. We're not uh, going to go be able to go to all the sessions. Well, we'll be able to go to one later, the final plenary, but in the morning, there were, of course, the concurrent tracks. I started off in the modeling development and disease session. Uh, I was actually a little disappointed that this session was happening at the very tail end of ICCR 2023. Yeah, this is one of the probably the biggest areas of study in IPS modeling and IPS biology is, of course, modeling development and disease. And they have to wait to the very last day of the, of the conference to, to cover it. Of course, this session was moderated in part by Ming Shagu, a friend of the show and also a, a mentor of mine who's a, an expert on all things pulmonary fibrosis and was uh, giving a short talk and on reconstructing organotypic endothelium and mesenchyme from IPSCs to study pulmonary diseases. This is what Ming Shou has been working on for a while now. She initially trained in the lab of Joe Wu at Stanford when I was a grad student there, and she's had expertise in the vasculature for a very long time, developing some of the initial iPSC endothelial cell uh, protocols and further refining them, uh, and now using them to full extent to, to develop different types of endothelium and subtypes of endothelium. I'm sure you can appreciate this. This is a hot area of study in IPS biology and just endothelial biology is how do you distinguish all the various types of endothelium that are found in the human body? Uh, of course, she's at Cincinnati Children's, which is a powerhouse for all sorts of organoid work. Um, I was actually having a conversation with one of my students who's interested in going to grad school down the road or in the future. And she was thinking about, you know, what's the best place in the country, in the U.S. to do organoid biology? That's what she wants to do for the next step of her career. And I told her, Cincinnati Children's, definitely take a close look there. They've got some amazing organoid folks there, including Ming Xiao, of course. Brian Wong was next up. He is from Columbia University. He's actually an MD-PhD student there, wrapping up his clinical training as well. And got that dual threat physician scientist kind of approach here. He's uh, in my neck of the woods as well. A lot of cardiac related and cardiovascular talks early in the morning here. Single, uh, sorry, loss of cardiac fibroblast bag three potentiates TGF beta uh, signaling and fibrosis in dilated cardiomyopathy. Of course, dilated cardiomyopathy is traditionally viewed as a disease of the myocardium of the, the muscular structure of the heart. But here, Brian was discussing the importance of the fibroblast, this supportive cell type that's found in the heart, and in particular how TGF-beta signaling, as you might expect, has an important role in regulating fibroblast transitional states and how ultimately that fibrosis can contribute to the formation of dilated cardiomyopathy using some model systems. So it's important to consider how the non-cardiomyocyte is actually influencing the uh, a, a cardiac or myocardium-specific phenotype here. Moving on to the next talk from uh, Mattia Francisco Maria Gurley from the University College London, UCL in the UK, single cell guided prenatal derivation of primary epithelial organoids from the human amniotic and tracheal fluids. This was really interesting. Basically, she was deriving organoids from prenatal tissue. That's pretty wild. Mm -hmm. It's not something I had considered before. Um, really, it's a, it's an in utero sample that's being sourced as uh, uh, as a source of, of of cells for organoid production, and 
perhaps this is a, a useful way to do some sort of in utero or prenatal disease modeling um, that I hadn't really considered before. So cool uh, out of the box thinking there. Shinichi Mei from the Center for IPS Cell Research in Kyoto, a very real powerhouse over there, which is where uh, Shinji Yamanaka has spent some time as well. A novel IPS-derived collecting duck cystogenesis model of, uh, of um, a polycystic kidney disease. It's really cool cyst-based organoids that are derived from primary tissue that he was showing here. And again, uh, really phenomenal primary tissue organoid work. This wasn't IPS-derived, but interesting implications for polycystic kidney disease. Next up from Harvard, uh, which is a uh, Wardia Afshar Saber, using human iPSC derived neurons to investigate SSADH deficiency, which is apparently an extremely rare disease, like ridiculously rare, and one in 10 million or something like that, that's characterized by uh, a lack of enzymes involved in the GABA breakdown. So obviously this is going to be a neuronal phenotype. And she shows some really cutting edge calcium imaging that uh, I appreciate as a cardiac biologist because it's not just neurons that can be subjected to calcium imaging, of course. Um, and then Yahweh Chen she wrapped up the session. She was one of the co-chairs of this particular session with Ming Shigu. Uh, told an interesting story, you know, from out over there in Mount Sinai, from your neck of the woods, about unexpected roles of extracellular vesicles in SARS-CoV-2. And I, I really liked this story because it was a very personalized look into how her lab, as a lung lab, actually was shifting in their role during the, the course of COVID. And she told a story about the specific day that she remembers, March 23rd, 2020, when everything shut down, everything started hitting the fan with COVID, of course. She started taking a beekeeping, uh, started doing some other alternate activities as well. And eventually her lab was able to shift its focus to covid related work. And of course, they were per perfectly positioned to do that as a lung lab. And they've discovered some really interesting results of how uh, extracellular vesicles may have a critical role in SARS-CoV-2 transmission and infection mechanisms, especially focusing on this TEMPERS-2 alternate receptor for the internalization of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I know we always talk about ACE2 as the primary mode of internalization, but there's all of these alternate receptors as well. And this is a, a nice, uh, unique look into the pathogenesis of SARS-CoV-2. There was not a whole lot of SARS-CoV-2 modeling work here at this ISCR in comparison to last year, which of course makes a lot of sense since hopefully we're at the tail end of this particular pandemic, at least I like to think. What COVID? <laughs> or no, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah well, you were in the modeling, which I, I was uh, sorry to miss that, but I was really tempted uh, both by some old connections and some really amazing talks. So I hit two tracks. The first one I was in was a gene-edited allogeneic T cell, so called like off-the-shelf product. I mean, I, I kind of began my day and ended my day with T cells, uh, although it's not quite over. We just came out of Michelle Satterline's lecture, which we're going to come around to. Um, but it's at, because uh, as the leader of the session mentioned, there was just a New England Journal article a couple of days ago um, des describing the use of uh, uh, our T cells, CAR T, to um, uh, solve ALL effectively. And not just the review of all the many cures they've been, but um, you know, new data. So uh, I wouldn't say we reached an inflection point of CAR T, but you know, once you're in the NEJM, uh, we're talking about widespread adoption, um, and that's where we're at. I mean, CAR T is there to stay. The first story uh, that I caught was from Mar Maria Thamelli, who's um, at Amsterdam, who originally came out of Michelle Satellane's lab. So a nice, agreeable symmetry there with the first and last. Uh, I collaborated with her briefly uh, while she was a postdoc at. Satellite lab back when I was failing to make hematopoietic progenitor stem cells from iPS cells. But she's continued on. She's working now on these off the shelf allocar T cells. Um, and, you know, her, her general approach was, and this is the way it is with these uh, hematopoietic CAR T people high, high level engineering, you know, using a lot of cellular engineering and knock in to strategic lo loci to make really efficient. Um, CAR T uh, cells that can be scalable from iPS cells. And that's the key there. From iPS cells, amazingly, still differentiating cells on OP9. I would have thought we'd move to a more, you know, synthetic matrix at this point, but it just shows you how tough a nut it is to crack 
um, but a lot of progress there. Then after that, I was uh, on to Mickey Ando, still in that session, who's from uh, Jun, uh, Juntendo, sorry if I got that wrong, University of Medicine in Japan. Um, she described some really exciting results using CAR T, again, hypoimmune CAR T that were generated via this, quote, scarless editing um, to address cervical, cervical cancer, you know, a major cause of cervical cancer, HPV. You got the HPV vaccine out there, but it's still a scourge, a major unmet need and very deadly. So uh, Mickey showed some really encouraging data showing how they could, um, you know, address cervical cancer in vitro and in, in vivo and in, in mouse models. We're not quite, quite to human trials yet, but uh, strong rationale for escalating those to, uh, to clinical trial and study. Um, and then in that session, before I bounced, I caught Tisha Rowland who is from Umoja, a company, they talked about a scalable bioreactor approach for off the shelf. In this case, more like NK cells, they call them these induced cytotoxic innate lymphoid cells or ICILs um, that were responsive to rapamycin. They had this engineered rapamycin re receptor uh, so that when they got rapamycin, they just ramped up and, and proliferated. She had a really nice scale up uh, description. They called it shred, you know, an in industry, they love their acronyms, the ICILs, and use the SHRED, synthetic receptor-enabled differentiation in order to get them. They get bioreactor expansion um, with a target of a trillion cells uh, per 50 liters. So, I mean, it means nothing to me, but it's a big number um, in a small volume. So clearly very impressive, and the SHRED method uh, helped them get there. The one thing I'll say about this, there's a lot of scale-up description, a lot about the numbers. Um, and there was some data, I will say, about tumor survival in mice. So they had some in vivo assay. But uh, I had this really nice discussion with a, a big deal guy, uh, a friend of mine from way back who's far exceeded my success uh, in his position to know, know a lot of things. And his impression uh, was that there's a bit of a disconnect between the engineering minds and the kind of experimental empirical minds that they're trying to bridge in the industry right now. You talk to these engineers and they just want to tell you how many viable cells they have. Um, but maybe there's not as much recognition that all these cells kind of have a mind of their own, so to speak. So uh, that this individual who's a KOL, if there ever was one, seems to think that we're in a, a, a point now where we're trying to reconcile these two ways of thinking. And I thought that was a really interesting point about what we're struggling with right now, which is a good problem to have, right? We're right on the precipice of translating these therapies. It's just a matter of getting these people in their heads together. Moving on from there, I went into these um, new embryo modeling talks, and this was a bombshell. First, it was uh, Am Fuang Li. I caught her to talk about amnioids. Uh, and, you know, I only realized at the end uh, that this is a, a member of the Carl Kohler lab. Whatever happened to Carl Kohler? Well, you thought he was still working on the inner ear organoid. He still is, but he's even gotten to now extra embryonic tissue and amnioids. Um, and Fuang Li is using them to examine the role of mechanotransduction in amniotic development with a nice model of this extra embryonic tissue. And then it was on what I, what I think was the landmark talk of the day of the session, for sure. The day, maybe the week. Uh, this was a talk from Rowan Carvis, who's at... Uh, Washington University in St. Louis, and uh, her focus was the extra embryonic potential of uh, naive pluripotent stem cells, leveraging that to get an integrated model of human development. Um, and the real key here was the post-implantation culture that, that she endeavored upon. You know, we all know the 14-day guideline there, but as she started talking about Day 18, I saw people leaning in, and there was a lot of OGs in, in the stem cell field and developmental biologists, you know, big names who I won't mention, but when they saw day 18, they leaned in, and that wasn't it. She went on to talk about day 21, but bottom line, even at day 18, she saw diversification, the embryo extra embryonic lineage, primitive streak, uh, brachiuri type stuff at day 21, mesoderm, endoderm derivatives, placental structures. She did some scRNA seq. Um, was comparing it, um, benchmarking it to Carnegie, Carnegie Stage 7 embryos, actually human embryos, which is where you get PGCs, you get blood progenitors. And here's the key, you get notochordal processes present at Carnegie Stage 7, which is scary, I guess, uh, when you talk about the sensationalist media coverage that we're getting. I think the idea that you're getting notochord 
in the beginning of these nervous system processes is a bit of a hot button uh, subject, but you can't fault Rowan or her university for going for this. They got deliberate, uh, very careful approval, approval from their escrow. I think for these experiments, given the results, if ever it was justified, which is the stipulation, the ISSCR guidelines, is that you have to establish the rationale for extending beyond day 14. And I think the rationale is there. The capability is there. Uh, what we found is tremendous uh, in terms of speaking to the capabilities of this model. And I think it's a very important experiment. I admire the courage of, of Rowan going after it and her group. Um, I had a real, I'll say it, I had a problem with the question from Chuck Murray after, which I think should have taken into account that, you know, the, the, the trainees are here to do the work and they're out there putting themselves on a limb. Um, when they take the measures to get the approvals, uh, I don't think it's necessary to ask them and put them on the spot about what a charged experiment it is. I mean, if it's the PI up there, fine. But I think we have to have the recognition that these sessions, particularly with the trainees, should be focused on the science and not the politics. So I, I had a bit of a problem with that. I thought it was a bit of a bad look. And I want to say to you, Rowan, here on the show, and I did say to you after the show, you nailed it. Great job. I can't wait to see what you do next. Um, and then uh, to finish, uh, there was a, a story from Kathy Niak from, from Cambridge, which was a really nice reminder why we still work on the mouse. It's important to look at early linear specification. And the good news there is that a lot of the fundamental mechanisms are conserved. Um, she actually showed a lot of experiments with human embryos, with actual uh, donated uh, human embryos to understand mechanisms of development and to, to cultivate human ES cells ultimately in more physiologic conditions. And she found conditions, namely um, in this laminin extracellular matrix that were really amenable to ES cell derivation. Um, she underscored the role of IGF and in insulin signaling. And get this, Arun, <laughs> she finished by talking about the, what they ultimately learned was that active and nodal is fundamentally required for pluripotency. You know who showed that more than 15 years ago in his doctoral work? Yours truly. So it's really nice to see that my uh, shoddy results have finally been reproduced after more than a decade. People are coming around to me and Ali Brivanlu's way of thinking. Really appreciate that nod. And generally, Arun, I was just so thrilled with this session because, you know, there was a lot of clinical stuff that I caught in that CAR-T end of it, but the embryo modeling stuff, while controversial, is really amazingly impressive. And I mean, I really cannot put my finger on where the limit's going to be as it stands. It's just mind boggling. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. I'm disappointed to have missed that session myself. I mean, I was, of course, really into the disease modeling side of things. That's kind of what I do. But, you know, the early embryo stuff is what you do. So I don't blame you for checking it out. Um, no, absolutely. And it's funny because now, I think it's not funny. It's very serious. Now we're not as much limited by the technical side of things. It's really the the ethical and pol political in some situations. But really, I, I agree with you. I think getting the pro appropriate approval from your institutional uh, stem cell research oversight committee, that to me, that's the bottom line, right? And I don't think putting a trainee on the spot for doing that experiment is the right thing to do. I totally agree with you. I think uh, – uh, I think she did a phenomenal job in addressing those questions, it sounds like. So moving on to the plenary number five, we only caught a little bit of this because we had to abandon ship to do some delegate sessions and chat with some of you folks who were interested in stopping by our little room here and uh, do a little short interview with us here on the podcast. But plenary five was, again, next generation in vitro model. And I've got to, again, just reiterate, I am bummed that this session, which is Again, what I do, so I'm biased, sure. I'm bummed that this session was at the very last day of ICCR 2023. The only talk we were able to catch before we had to bail was from Roger Cam, and uh, he was talking about vascularized models. Also, this is apparently the first time that Roger Cam had been to ICCR, which was shocking to me. Vascularized models for neurological disease modeling using uh, pluripotent stem cells. He uh, is developing a system that's kind of in parallel to something that Clive Svensson has developed over at my neck of the woods in Cedar sinai which is this blood-brain barrier on a chip. Uh, cool microfluidic platform design and engineering approaches for really fundamentally in understanding the role of vascularization and the importance of vascularization in setting up that blood-brain barrier model. 
also performed some Alzheimer's disease modeling and really beautiful images of amyloid beta in the organ on chip vasculature and the, the flow of the beta uh, structures through that particular chip system. And the other cool thing is these are all either IPS or ESC derived endothelial models. And of course, we can talk forever on what subtype of endothelial cells they were actually deriving and using in this particular chip. But I think the, the power is in the model itself and in the engineering. So then we, like I said, we had to abandon ship and we had to go down and chat with some uh, some delegates. And it's of course not not a negative. We love chatting with you folks and just some names to highlight. We chatted with Isha Verma at uh, Michigan, Ryan Hickmott, who's really got an amazing skill for science communication. So stay tuned for these delegate sessions. And you'll get a, an understanding of what we're talking about. These folks are so passionate about the science that they're doing, sharing why they're interested in attending ICCR, what were their favorite talks that they went to, what was their favorite part about the last day of ICCR, day four here. Of course, got to give a shout out to our guy Rustam, all the way from Kazakhstan. Uh, but he's a world traveler. He's been to the Netherlands, working at UNC Chapel Hill, been all over the place. And of course, Davi Lira Laite from Paul Burridge's lab. Thank you, all of you, for deciding to stop by our little uh, booth here, a recording st studio here, and uh, sharing your interests and passions for ICCR 2023. Uh, moving on briefly to plenary number six, which is the uh, we're, that's the last plenary that we were able to catch at the moment. We'll be uh, checking out some of the, the final plenary talks and in the moments to come just after this recording, uh, clinical applications of gene therapy and gene editing. That was the real focus here of plenary number six. And this is where things got really clinical. A lot of uh, industrial and uh, uh, private, as well as some academic clinical trials out there, specifically focusing on matopoietic stem and gene uh, editing, uh, using CRISPR and other approaches, editing predominantly for inborn errors of metabolism and immunity. That was really the focus of Alessandro Ayuti's talk from Italy. Presented similar work last year, and it's cool to see the progress here. It's actually kind of paralleling Don Cohn's work at UCLA, where, uh, you know, I think... Honestly, I think this bubble boy skid disease is a thing of the past. It's in, in my mind, it's effectively cured because there are so many different approaches to, to correct this particular disorder. Salim Corbiakoglu from uh, Germany, efficacy and safety of a CD34 positive cell therapy using a CRISPR-Cas9 approach for uh, ameliorating, alleviating beta thalassemia and also sickle cell. And honestly, I can say this as well. I think sickle cell is effectively cured at this point. It seems like there's so many other approaches for uh, for modifying genes to to alter uh, that disease prognosis. And potentially, as the moderator said, this is the first gene editing cell product that could be approved uh, by the FDA for, for therapeutic applications. So that's really cool to see. Um, the intersection of cell therapy and gene editing for maximum effect. That's really cool. Laura Sepp Lorenzino, clinical advances in CRISPR-based genome editing, again, for a variety of diseases. This is expanded beyond just the blood side of things, but also looking at transthyroid and amyloidosis, focusing on the liver. Uh, this particular disease also causes cardiomyopathy, but there's just a, a single CRISPR-based gene therapy that they're using to correct this particular disorder. There's an NEGM paper that came out of this study, this area of research uh, in 2021. And the next thing they want to target here is hereditary angioedemia. And one of my favorite talks, this was not a, a science, it was a science talk, but it was more than that. This was the patient advocate address from Alison Barrett. So this is a uh, she's very heavily involved with the foundation for Angelman syndrome therapeutics or fast. She shared an incredible story of science and parenthood and fear and courage and, and love for, for her child who was diagnosed with Angelman syndrome within six months of life. And she made it her objective and her mission as a parent and also as a clinician to figure out ways to accelerate treatments for Angelman syndrome and perhaps in effect to help treat her daughter. Uh, just, a, just such an inspiration, just an in, inspirational story. And I think for me personally, just something I felt very strongly just as a new parent, you know, a parent will do anything for the sake of their child. And this is, this is a case example of that. And then wrapping up with the John McNeish Memorial Lecture from Michelle Sadlein from MSK, a nice overview of genome edited CAR T cells, just a broad overview of the progression and the, just the meteoric rise of the CAR T field. I mean, currently six CAR T cell products are approved by the FDA, four targeting CD19 and two against BCMA. 
But you know, this is just the tip of the CAR T iceberg. There's so many, so many different products that are in clinical trials right now, and who knows what's going to emerge in the years to come. Yes, as you said, Arun, this was heavily clinical, and for me, a, a real illustration of the amazing impact that's happened in, in just you know over a decade or so, I guess, since these therapies have been really uh, put into people. Um, those first two talks, for example, you know, Alessandra Ayudi and uh, Celine Carbosioglu, uh, the first one, I'll start with the second, you know, the, the sickle cell therapy, um, you know, that's Stuork and seminal approach of reactivating the fetal hemoglobin. So what's old is new again. Um, and I thought their efficacy was very impressive. Also, speaking of Alessandro's uh, uh, story, optimizing graph and all that they've learned over the many years on how to get the cells in. But also what came out to me was the disease background element. The disease background is huge. I remember uh, talking to Shannon McKinney Freeman an episode, a few episodes ago, and she made a really great point about sickle cell, for example, uh, which is that when you're curing um, these diseases in adults, there's still a lifetime of the inflammation and perhaps some kind of clonality or uh, clonal heterogeneity of intermediate potential um, or indefinite potential in, in these patients uh, that you don't take into account. So you're curing them, but the, the lasting effect of disease is still there. So I was really impressed with Alessandra Ayudi's approach where they're getting in there really early. I mean, this is not only important for diseases that are, you know, have developmental effects, which they show tremendous efficacy in getting these kids back on track, but also with general disease, you know, thalassemia is a sickle cell. I think that it's going to be important in the future to address these diseases early. So we haven't even seen the real extent of the cures yet is the upshot here. I think we have people who have dealt with lifelong disease and may still have some complications, even though they're genetically cured. I think that as we move forward, we'll be getting these into people younger. We'll be avoiding some of the complications. And, and some of the data shown here was key uh, to, to supporting the potential of that, showing that they had engraftment out to uh, over 15 years in some cases. So it looks like these therapies and cells are going to be long-lived in people, and that was very encouraging. Also, the lower Sep Lorenzo, you described that, but Intellia Therapeutics, you know, the scientific founder there, Jennifer Doudna. So here we go with uh, the therapies where the seeds were planted many, many years ago with the advent of CRISPR. Now, finally, try, the results are starting to come out. Uh, she talked about um, there were results for gene therapy in the liver, but also, uh, which was knockout based, but also they're talking about knock in uh, for factor nine treatment for hemophilia. So that's really exciting. Uh, the treatment's all LNP basis. The one caveat I would say hey, to be a naysayer, it doesn't really take away um, from the, how impressive these results are. But yeah, I mean, if you're treating something in the liver, you're, you're in good shape, but in other organs, it may be a problem. I mean, the liver is the sponge for the body. I have a collaborator who uses LNP in, encapsulated mod RNA, and they get, you know, less than 1% of the LNPs go to other distal organs, the target organs, whereas most of it ends up in the liver, in the spleen, in the adrenals, um, as, as uh, Dr. Sepp Lorenzo mentioned. But, you know, a limitation when you're looking outside the liver, but no less impressive for these disease indications that they're going after, where they killed it. I mean, they were trying to treat and show uh, QC with 10x of the therapeutic dose. So they're really being careful and really showing efficacy. And like you, Arun, I'm always inspired. The patient advocate statement is such an essential component of the ISSCR program. I mean, I think they should, if they could do it in the beginning even, maybe it just gets you going, uh, but maybe it's good enough to finish with it. You know, in this case you described it, but the people affected by disease in my view are often the greatest advocates because yeah, sure, they're, they're motivated but their passion and their tireless devotion are no less an inspiration for that fact. In fact, this was a reminder to me that the insiders, whether it's Doug Melton, uh, who had a child affected by diabetes, or in this case, Alison Barant, um, who has a child affected by Angelman syndrome, they have a unique power to affect change. Uh, but so do we, right? And if we mobilize even a fraction of the will, uh, that those affected directly by disease are able to do, we could really move the needle. So every time I see one of these talks, I, I want to get, maybe that's why they put it at the end. Everyone's rushing back to the lab to try and make a difference. And I'm definitely in that camp. And then finally, the J John McNeish Memorial Lecture, 
uh, a great, I think, bookend for me personally, even though I'm going to go to the awards talks after this, a great bookend for the whole session, the whole week, the whole conference, because, uh, you know, alongside Carl June, Michelle Satellin is one of the major stewards of CAR-T uh, a decade now after the first successful applications. He gave a really nice review of, of where we stand and more than that, where we're going. There's more than a thousand CAR trials that are listed with the NIH. Um, and as Michelle mentioned, there's so much room for improvement. Um, and that's what he discussed. Four stories or four little pieces of, of his research that illustrate how much better we can make the system. So really exciting, encouraging words for, uh, for that uh, field, but also for all of us uh, who you know care about uh, curing disease and cancer. Um, and then, you know, that's it for us, but uh, we still are going to be here and we're still going to go to the presidential or the uh, the whole series of, of awards lectures, but they're kicking us out of the media room, guys. So this is going to be the end of the recording. But just FYI, we've got a, a bit left, you know, the final address from Hyphen Lin, the current president, also uh, an ISSCR president elect address uh, from Amanda Clark, who's always got inspiring words. Um, the public service award lecture from uh, Christine Mummery, who received the war, uh, award, uh, presumably for her, you know, tireless work uh, as a steward of the Stem Cell Reports Journal, which was founded 10 years ago. Then Cedric Blancpain, who's got the ISSCR Momentum Award uh, this year. Um, he's going to talk about mechanisms regulating tumor transition, which has always been his thing. Um, and Thomas Rand, who, who's got the ISSCR Achievement Award this year, is going to talk about stem cell quiescence etc. I mean, he's got a million things he could go into. And then finally, the keynote from Alan Spradling. Um, this is a guy, I got to tell a quick story. One of the first conferences I ever went to, in fact, the first conference I went to as a postdoc was Shaheen's lab. He, as he was wont to do, ditched the, the whole thing and he sent me and, and, and uh, one of my compatriots instead. And of course, he gave me his, his lodgings. And so I was very surprised when I showed up at the dorms, which they put us up in. I mean, I guess they didn't have a lot of money. This was an early days. Sean Morrison was running this um, conference. Since then, he, he's got a bit more money to, to put things together. Back then, they must not have had it. They put us in the dorms. I arrived there as I'm supposed to be Shaheen. Who do I see as my bunkmate? Literally, bunk beds, Alan Spradling. <laughs> you would have thought he was like, what the hell am I doing here bunking with some green postdoc? But he gave zero Fs. I mean, that guy came there to think, to speak, and to sleep. And that's what that was his agenda. And not much has changed. I mean, he's coming here with a, a very big overview. I'm really looking forward to his talk. Uh, and just remind him that we were bunkmates once. So uh, I'm definitely going to catch that one. Sorry, I can't relay the content to you. But hey, if you catch it online, or if you hear, hear about it anywhere else, I, I guarantee it's going to be a good one. Um, and that's it. I mean, Arun, you got to give your final closing thoughts. But for me, I thought this was a great meeting. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I thought it, it, it had some some problems, uh, logistical. Uh, I feel like there were a few people missing that, that I would have liked to see. But I, I loved uh, all my interactions here. I really had such a great time, uh, mostly with, with the, the younger people, with the trainees, uh, with the listeners of the podcast. I think we had a great time chatting about what we care about um, and, and you know making those connections that are important to carry through in science. I hope you guys stay with us forever. I'm certain keeping my eye on all of your careers. Uh, Arun, what were your thoughts? Yeah, echoing that, just a big thank you to everybody who's run into us in the hallways or here in the recruit recording booth, just showing their appreciation for the work we do on the podcast. And we are just as appreciative of you all for showing love and appreciation for, you know, our work. It's, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship, I guess, but, you know, we do this because we love doing it and we love bringing a, a service and a, uh, hopefully it can provide you with some level of satisfaction and service for this particular meeting. You know, hopefully we're able, we're able to do this meeting justice and recap some of the amazing science that was happening out there. I mean, when it comes to the science and the things that are of most excitement to me, the things that I was most excited by, I mean, this is perhaps no surprise for those of you who have listened to the show in months past, but I'm still so excited about these early embryo models. And I do think there's a reason why we led off with Magdalena's talk as the first talk. And certainly it did generate a bit of public press and a bit of controversy and digital drama, whatever you want to call it. 
But this is, in my mind, the hardest subfield of stem cell biology. And it was reflected even in some of the, the concurrent sessions as well. So many early embryo modeling talks were pushing the frontiers of what's possible with these early embryo models and you know, hoping the, the ethical side of things can stay up to date and stay concurrent with you know, how far and how fast this technology is progressing. That was amazing to see. But also just, of course, the clinical translation. And it's a bummer to me, and I'm not in charge with making the, the schedule for ISSCR by any means, but I'm kind of disappointed by the fact that those clinical translation talks happen on the very last day. And I, I kind of understand why they want to keep people around just uh, for the full entire meeting. You don't want to front load the meeting, I suppose, and have all the clinical translation talks up first, but maybe somewhere in the middle next time, you know? But yeah, in general, a, a really good meeting scientifically. Some glitches, of course. We had to give a final shout out to Room 257. <laughs> it was a bit of a cluster. Um, but hey, you know, everybody got out without the the fire marshals shutting down the whole conference. So I suppose that's a victory. Um, and maybe next time they'll put Juan Carlos's talk in a, a plenary session. Maybe just a just a hint for for the organizers out there. Yeah. Overall, I'm just so happy to see everybody in person. It was a really well attended ISSCR, a step up from last year. I don't know what the digital virtual attendance was, but the energy was definitely here in person. It was just so cool to see everybody's beautiful shining faces again. Yes, it was. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our ISSCR 2023 episode series. We've met a lot of people, had a lot of fun, and we already can't wait for the 2024 meeting in Hamburg, Germany. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or via email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. Until the next time you hear our voices, thank you guys so much for listening.